I am Bill Valerio. I'm the director of Woodmere Art Museum, and I am very, very pleased to welcome you tonight. I am thrilled to introduce my good friend, Chris Reed, who is going to speak with us. Ah, and there we are together. I wasn't kidding. We really are good friends. There we are in a selfie, the best kind of selfie that two old geezers like us can manage, um, holding the phone in front of us and getting most of us into the frame. Chris and I um, went to graduate school in art history together. We had the same dissertation advisor, which makes us brothers in art history. And I could not be happier to have had the opportunity to work with Chris, not only on this project associated with the Gilbert Lewis exhibition at Woodmere, but also an upcoming exhibition that will be taking place both at Woodmere and at Penn State University um, that Chris was involved in the organization of on the artist Warren Rohr. So, so exciting to be working together with Chris, who is a distinguished professor of English and visual culture at Penn State University. Chris has written, a book, has written many books and is widely published and um, has, has participated in, in, in many distinguished and important um, projects involving the history of art. Um, a book that is completely relevant to the talk tonight, Gay Community Nudes, the Art of Gilbert Lewis is Chris's book, Art and Homosexuality, A History of Ideas. And if you don't own that book and you're on this call, you should um, you know, write this down, Art and Homosexuality, A History of Ideas, Chris Reed, and go on to Amazon afterwards and buy it. It's a fascinating book because it treats homosexuality as a changing idea over history. And so what did Michelangelo think about his own attraction to men? And what do people in the 20th century think about Michelangelo's attraction to men? Um, looking back at him, you know, over the expanse of 500 years with very different ideas about what this thing, this um, sexual thing means. And so it's a fascinating read and, and I, you know, I, I can't recommend it enough. I enjoyed it immensely having read it recently. So um, with that, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. I wanna to thank you, Chris, for being my friend and for being, you know, so willing to throw yourself into the Gilbert Lewis exhibition. And I know we all look forward to what it is that you're going to share with us tonight. Thank you all. I'm going to put myself on, um, you know, closed video and I look forward to the presentation. Thank you all. Uh, thank you so much, Bill. I'm really, really uh, delighted to be here. Um, I'm assuming that if anything goes wrong, somebody will jump on and uh, tell me because uh, I'm looking at my PowerPoint as you all are, and I hope that that makes a delightful visual experience. I always say that art historians get nervous during talks if there's not images because we're not used to people looking at us. So I'll, I will be on live at the end for Q&A and discussion with people, um, but I'm just going to uh, uh, delight in some images uh, as I go through the talk and please delight in them with me. But I thought I should begin by uh, explaining my title. When I was beginning to think about the central issues in Gilbert Lewis's career, what struck me was uh, the kind of echo between the central terms that kept coming to me as I was thinking about him and the title of this newspaper. So my central terms obviously are gay community nudes, and this is the terrible pun on gay community news. But this newspaper really chronicled and helped to define a certain kind of not New York integrated gay and lesbian cultural and political uh, experience 
that um, really coincides with Gilbert Lewis's career. Gay Community News published between uh, 1973 um, and 1992. And if you squint very closely at these old issues, which I went down to the basement and found the file and dragged them out, you will just be able to see my byline on this selection of articles I wrote on actually many more articles from them than I remembered by the time I went down um, and uh, looked in the file. Um, so I want to um, begin by saying how happy I am for this exhibition that uh, took me back uh, to this period. Um, I want to thank Bill and everybody at Woodmere um, for the work that they did on this exhibition, which includes producing this very um, important online catalog that everybody uh, has access to, um, to uh, that documents important issues and um, and uh, has a chronology of Gilbert Lewis's career. Um, and I also want to thank Eric Rimshaw and Jody Pinto, whose words are in the catalog, but they were also both kind enough to talk to me during that time that I was putting this talk together. And so I'll be quoting from them uh, this evening. Uh, some of what I'll be quoting comes from the catalog and some of what I'll be quoting um, comes from uh, the conversations that I really enjoyed uh, having uh, with them. So, um, uh, and I also want to make the point that it's not only the exhibition that's uh, here at Woodmere, but, um, but the Gilbert Lewis celebration has also been contributed to by uh, PAFA, which will be uh, opening uh, an exhibition in November, uh, also about Gilbert Lewis and the online exhibition uh, at the William Way LGBT Community Center. There's that word community again. Um, and so working together, these three institutions have really created an amazing moment um, to document, study, enjoy the work of Gilbert Lewis. I've learned a lot from all of these um, venues and the educational materials that, they're, that they've put out. And it gives us an occasion to really think about um, the issue that Bill honored me with the invitation to speak about, um, which is to put Lewis's life and work into some broader context that have to do uh, with sexual identity. So yeah, that big context and the one that I think Bill had in mind when he invited me is and it was nice of you to plug the book, but I'm giving them a visual, so you can, <laughs> you can remember it. Um, uh, this book on art and homosexuality, and you can see the subtitle is A History of Ideas. And my point there was that modern, the modern identities of quote-unquote the artist and the modern identities of quote-unquote homosexual um, both came into being in the 19th century out of a complex confluence of historical forces that you can read about. Um, they came into being not only simultaneously, but in relation to each other with similar characteristics. That is the idea of it being a kind of inborn nature that needs to be realized. The kid, you know, realizes he's an artist, the kid who realizes is attracted to other men, um, and that it's realized by breaking particular social norms, moving away from the family, moving to the big city, being creative, all of those kinds of, you know, we can call them cliches, but they really helped to frame people's experience of themselves. So much so that the two identities often came to be seen as signs of each other. Um, my book opens with a quotation from uh, Kurt Vonnegut's semi-autobiographical novel, Time Quake. The quote is, quote, um, if you really want to hurt your parents and you don't have nerve enough to be homosexual, at least you can go into the arts. So that sentiment, which seems so dated now, but I was surprised when I looked it up for this talk because I thought, oh, this must really be a back in the day kind of thought. But the, that novel is from 1997, so it's not so long ago. Um, and it really offers the broadest context for understanding Gilbert Lewis's place in an art world structured, whether ecstatically for some people or deeply suspiciously for other people around this ideology that there's you know, something that these two concepts have to do with each other. And on the suspicious side, um, you know, that commonly held connection between art and homosexuality often provoked defensive performances of homophobia and misogyny that we can see throughout the kind of history of modern art among artists who felt the need to demonstrate over and over again that they and their art weren't feminine, weren't gay, whatever. But I'm more interested in the positive side, the attraction of sexual outsiders to the idea that art could provide some sort of community, some sort of way of expressing themselves. 
So some of the strategies that were adopted by gay American artists in the first half of the 20th century allowed for interesting kinds of coding that allowed things to be said and not said at the same time. And here I'm thinking about artists uh, Martin Hartley in the circle of Gertrude Stein, for example, who adopted modes of ab abstraction and repetition that, like her writing, left interpretation up to the audience. And so in addition to the Hartley painting here, um, I'm showing you a play by uh, um, Gertrude Stein. I won't try to render the title because I can never remember how many eyes are in the play, but you can see uh, that one of the characters is M and then the last the name ends with N and then H, just like Marsden Hartley. Um, so this idea of her kind of alluding to him, these very, very ambiguous repetitious phrases that she uses. And of course her, you know, sort of consummate phrase, a rose is a rose is a rose, which is became her symbol. And that's uh, uh, in the upper part of the screen, there is a little um, detail from her stationery. Um, so that, you know, this very much was uh, associated with, uh, with her identity. Other artists, so in addition to this kind of abstraction repetition um, strategy, there was also the strategy of turning to kind of abstruse invented symbolism that again allowed for a range of interpretations. So things could be said and not said at the same time, as we can see uh, in this example from Charles Demuth from the series of paintings that he called poster portraits, which is interesting, an interesting nomenclature in itself, since they are actually paintings, not posters. Um, but this kind of allusion to something that could be multiplied and reproduced. And this one, of course, depicts, after a fashion, Gertrude Stein herself. Um, this one, uh, Calla Lilies, depicts a person named uh, Bert Savoy. And here you can see that Bert Savoy was the era's most extravagant and famous drag performer. Now, I'm not claiming that Demuth's many for, uh, floral still lives are all coded portraits of drag queens or coded portraits of anyone, in fact. But it's interesting to note how Demuth used watercolors both to render flowers and to create the kind of astonishing um, uh, collection in his work of images of gay life in the and as you can see here, this image of the, the, the sailor's bar and the two sailors dancing together. One of them is kind of giving the eye to the sailor next to him. Um, uh, uh, so there's, there are many works along these lines, some of them much racier than, uh, than this one. And of course, even the A Distinguished Air from 1930, which is a kind of humorous send up of the ability of abstraction to convey sexually subversive meanings, the kind of um, uh, conflation of two brand Brancusi portraits, um, uh, uh, two Brancusi sculptures uh, into, into something kind of amazingly phallic. And again, the uh, kind of uh, looks, looks from side to side among the people who are uh, looking uh, at the sculpture, suggesting that different kinds of looks will reveal different uh, kinds of meanings. We see a similar dynamic in later gay artists, probably most famously uh, Robert Mapplethorpe, as you can see here, the uh, his well-known comments, sell the public flowers, things that they can hang on their walls without being uptight. Um, so the, and, and there's a kind of echo of that, I think sometimes in Gilbert Lewis's uh, work, his flower portraits uh, uh, sold better than his portrait portraits um, uh, during his lifetime. But for Mapplethorpe, these flower images become a kind of alter ego for the hard, more hardcore images that people became very familiar with during the culture wars uh, in the 1980s. And again, we can see certain echoes of that in Gilbert Lewis's work. So here are a couple of his extremely accomplished and beautiful uh, floral still lives. And here are some where I think they blend in interesting ways with the idea of representing sexuality, um, uh, whether in a kind of symbolic way or in this, this uh, uh, juxtaposition um, that you see uh, in the image on the left. But by jumping all the way ahead to Maplethorpe, I've gotten a little bit of ahead of myself. So I want to return to historical precedents in the first half of the 20th century as a way of sketching the background for Gilbert Lewis's career as a gay American artist. We might think not only of international modernists like Marston Hartley and Charles Demuth, but of a more homegrown American strand of realism represented, uh, for instance, by uh, Paul Cadmus, 
who in the 1930s expanded the kind of repertoire of imagery that we saw in Dima's tiny little watercolors that documented gay culture. Um, Cadmus was able to uh, translate that into a much larger scale and more public venues, something that seemed to be acceptable because his work registered at the time as satire. There's a kind of fascinating story behind this painting that people may know. It was taken from a works project administration exhibition at the Corcoran Gallery. It was confiscated by the Navy and then kind of immediately turned over to an all men's club in Washington, D.C., where it hung on the wall as a kind of open secret um, for almost uh, 50 years. Cadmus was, of course, also a very accomplished portrait artist with a commitment to document documenting his lovers and friends, people who made up his community. And he shared with Gilbert Lewis an interest in media associated with early Renaissance painting, chalk and pencil, for instance, for drawings. Uh, and as Aaron uh, Feltman pointed out in a, a really lovely talk uh, a few weeks ago here uh, um, at Woodmere or on the Woodmere website, um, uh, using water-based paints rather than uh, oil paints. I think a bit also in thinking of early 20th century uh, kind of anticipations of Gilbert Lewis, I think of an artist like Grant Wood, who was not publicly known to be gay until long after his death. But his detailed deadpan portraits are at once kind of affectionate, slightly whimsical. They really remind me of um, Gilbert Lewis's sensibility. Um, if I think about a painting like this and note the sort of um, detail, the reflections in the glasses, the way the, the hair is sort of kind of carefully tousled, they have a kind of that kind of straightforward um, Grant Woodish look about them. And when I asked Gilbert's friend, uh, Eric Rimshaw, about this, he confirmed that indeed, he told me, uh, Gilbert admired Grant Wood for his tongue-in-cheek attitude. Uh, and Eric cited this as a, as a painting that Gilbert Lewis was particularly fond of, saying, note how uh, Grant Wood has used the cherries as the little ball fringe on the um, uh, in this kind of uh, whimsical Parson Weems fable image. So that's a kind of um, overview of the sorts of art that we might associate with um, uh, homosexuality among men, kind of gay cultures, gay co subcultures um, in the, uh, the pre-war period in the first part of the half of the 20th century. Um, turning to more recent history, gay artists in the post-war period, of course, sustained dynamics associated with strategies of abstraction and coding uh, into the post-war era, but these practices of reticence were challenged uh, like so much else in the 1960s when Andy Warhol's portraits made a spectacle of his high-powered queer milieu. I don't know that I would really call the factory a community, um, but it's, uh, it's definitely a group of people and, um, and like uh, like Gilbert Lewis, Warhol was kind of fascinated with the genre of portraiture um, and um, what, it could, what it could convey about the people uh, in his circle. Probably more relevant to Gilbert Lewis's work though among artists of that period is David Hockney, and I'm making the transition here obviously by showing you an Andy Warhol portrait of um, David Hockney. We know that Hockney was an artist that Gilbert Lewis admired, and it's certainly, um, he's, whoops, and he's somebody uh, to, um, to whom uh, Gilbert Lewis's work has been um, compared. So here I'm going to quote again from Gilbert Lewis's friend, Eric Rimshaw, who recalls, uh, um, quote unquote, Gilbert was not that enamored with modernists, but he loved David Hockney. What he learned from his work was immediacy, that almost single layer of paint that caught the image and appeared totally intentional from the first brush strokes. There were never layers of overworking. He liked the freshness that brought to the painting. That's the end of that quote. And I think if you look at this uh, comparison that I put together of a work by Hockney and a work by Lewis, you can see that Lewis also really admired Hockney's fearless deployment of color at a time when a lot of artists were inhibited about colors that seemed fey or feminine and what they might connote. Both of these guys were happy to use turquoise and lavender um, and kind of um, uh, put them together in this way in their depictions of their community. And again, uh, quoting uh, Gil's friend, Eric, he says that um, 
that they were also very impressed about the way, quote, Hockney was relatively open about his gay life. Gilbert identified with that. Okay, finally, um, in, this, uh, in this comparison, um, uh, his friend Eric says that Gilbert liked that Hockney painted what he saw, but through his own mind's eye. It was a strong and often skewed point of view that allowed for personal vision, not perfect reproduction. Gilbert's work often has that skewed point of view where he emphasizes particular features or adjusts his perspective. And I think you can kind of see that in this, um, in this juxtaposition of figures, which um, I put together not just because they have big cats um, in similar positions in them, um, but it really, uh, um, it, it, they, there's a kind of slightly odd perspective. Um, it's obviously a very carefully composed perspective. On the one hand, it seems like daily life. On the other hand, it's very clear that it's been thought through. Um, and I think that that's, um, there, that that in combination with the kind of flat color that they both use, which has a kind of air of, you know, just depicting what's there, there's a sort of blend of the carefully constructed and the, you know, here, here it is, this is what, this is what life looks like, that I think really speaks to a kind of aesthetic gay position um, at this period where the situation of daily life to, in order to, you know, have a kind of fulfilling and, and pleasurable and um, healthy daily life, people really had to think through what the details of that were going to be um, emotionally, socially, aesthetically. Um, there had to be a lot of planning, preparation. It allowed for kind of quirky points of view, and then you just have to accept it. And so I think that combination of sophisticated composition and very, and obviously artificial composition um, and very sort of flat color um, says something interesting about the uh, kind of uh, mindset of the period. Um, and then this appreciation of how much work it takes to kind of sustain that life, I think goes with an idea of appreciating the people who contribute to that life with us, with our, our friends and lovers and partners and um, you know, sort of social networks. And again, this is something that you certainly see with David Hockney here, famous um, double portrait of Henry Geldzahler, who was a curator at the Met, who really did a lot to um, help gay artists um, in the 1960s. Um, get sort of credibility and visibility. Um, Geldzeller and Christopher Scott here again in one of these very aestheticized and yet, you know, sort of completely frankly depicted uh, interior. Uh, and then again, Hockney um, uh, depicting his lovers in the same way that um, Gilbert and Lewis, uh, Gilbert Lewis, um, uh, you know, works with this idea. I think it's all this, the same model in uh, tribute. Um, but, uh, but that idea that sexuality is very much a part of this kind of carefully composed, aesthetically, sensually um, delightful um, uh, uh, life. So this may be a good place to um, make the point that Gilbert Lewis, and I learned this in, in putting this talk together, quite self-consciously grew into the concentration on portraiture that we know uh, that we think know about him today, and it's what we most people think of, I think, when they think of Gilbert Lewis's paintings. But in fact, throughout his time as a student at PAFA in the 1960s and into the 1970s, a significant part of his art, it's hard to know, maybe even all of his art, was not portraiture at all, but rather these kinds of mysteriously evocative scenes that we can see um, and, and this is on display on the walls at Woodmere for those of you who are able to go. This is a little artist's magazine. Uh, it was edited by Jody Pinto in 1972. Um, and the second issue, which was, uh, there were only two issues, included these little reproductions of Gilbert Lewis's paintings. Um, and you can see they're not portraits. They're, you know, pictures, pictures of scenes with one at the most two um, sometimes with uh, no people in them at all. Looking back now on these paintings, when I talked to Jody Pinto, she described these little gouaches she used. She thought for a long time, very kind of thoughtful use of language. And the word that she chose to describe them was secretive. She says they are paintings that are ingrown, meditative, 
listening, theatrical, which gay life was at that time. Everyone wore a mask. Everyone even tried to move like they thought they should move. And these gouaches have that aloneness, that listening, she said, which I think is a really beautiful um, description of these paintings. As I said, um, all but one depicts a figure by himself or no figures at all. In the one composition that you see on the lower left um, with the two figures together, they are not interacting with each other, but staring at the TV. To me, these little paintings with figures have something of the quality of film stills, or maybe the empty spaces look like stage sets. Uh, this one, uh, blown up to a kind of crazy big detail here because it's a very tiny reproduction. Um, a man's head lying amid the grass and weeds brings to my mind another famous Philadelphia artwork that was getting a lot of attention um, that, and that hovers around sexual secrets and theatricality. And I'm thinking here of Marcel Duchamp's, which was installed at the Philadelphia Museum uh, in uh, 1969. I'm sure all the Philadelphians, all the art historians <laughs> know that you look at it through this tiny little peephole in the wall and then there's the body in the grass and weeds uh, that you uh, see inside. But no one seems now to know what became of these paintings by Gilbert Lewis. Um, I was able, um, thanks to Eric, to get this picture of one uh, probably from the mid 1970s, um, which I think maintains that quality of being a set for a play or a movie, a space just kind of waiting for the actors to arrive. Um, but the paintings that we know and the paintings that are being celebrated in the exhibition, three exhibitions uh, in Philadelphia today are, you know, here are the actors, the people have arrived. Um, the focus is increasingly in his art on the individuals who entered that stage, who constituted his community, although it must be said it was not a community of which he was so much a kind of full-fledged participant as he was somebody already looking on in a way that he thought of himself as being from a slightly older generation. One of his exhibition statements says, quote, my portraits serve to commemorate the tribe of contemporary creative youth. And about his portrait sitters, he said, my good fortune was that my young models really appreciated the fact that an adult person was there for them, not telling them what to do. I never gave them explicit instructions other than to tell them where to sit or stand. I let them decide how they would do it. I took the cue from each model, end quote. And he talks about how, you know, he encouraged people to bring their own clothes, bring their own extravagant clothes, bring the things they want to be pictured in, um, and really kind of help him to create the image uh, that, uh, celebrates and conveys their particular um, aesthetic uh, pre self-presentation. This impulse to celebrate community runs through the work of many gay and lesbian artists in the 1960s, you know, right up to the 1980s, which I think is interesting because, of course, that was a time when those identities were attached to active movements organized around generating new forms of politics, aesthetics, sociability, and sex, here I'm thinking about artists like Jeb, um, uh, whose career was very consciously self-centered, uh, ideal lesbian community. Um, her photographs often appeared, as you see here, with very kind of explicit uh, captions describing who the people were, and often um, quotations from the sitters, or as in this case, um, quotations from important uh, feminist texts to contextualize what the significance of the images um, were and how they again contributed to a sort of a particular um, idea of a radical sexual and political and emotional and personal um, community uh, for, for women in the 1970s. Or if I think a little bit later, I think of somebody like Kathy Opie in the 1990s, who um, talked about her um, portrait photographs as a way of celebrating what she called her queer quote unquote family. Um, and she often referred to um, these kinds of images as her family portraits. This documentary portrait impulse was I think more characteristic of lesbian art and artists in the decades from the 70s to the 90s. Um, they were celebrating the excitement of what seemed like a new form of feminist community outside of conventional familial norms, social norms. 
What's interesting to me is how Gilbert Lewis brought this attitude not only to the, his you know, tribe of quote unquote contemporary creative youth, but um, to another community that he was engaged with. And that of course um, is the inhabitants of the nursing homes where, where he was an art therapist. Lewis described nursing homes as living spaces outside of the nuclear family. His memorable phrase is orphan, quote unquote, orphanages for elderly adults. Um, and he, here too, he uh, took up portraiture about which he said, quote, when I was with them doing their portraits, we were one-on-one -on -one and we were free to talk about whatever they wanted with assurance that it would remain confidential. They often told me things even their children didn't know. So we see in the way that he described his nursing home portraits and his portraits of young men, Lewis stressed the social interaction of the portrait moment itself, the process of making the painting as a form of community. And this is really very different from what was connoted by the term gay art as it was used in the 1980s, when that term was publicizing figurative erotic tradition um, exemplified um, by an artist like George Stavrinos, who was an artist that Lewis knew and admired. The image on the left shows the two of them together um, at an uh, exhibition opening for Stavrinos. Um, Stavrinos was a very successful fashion illustrator, as you can see here on the left in the drawing from Bergdorf Goodman, um, who also lent his talents to the emerging gay culture of 70s and 80s New York, as you can see in the rather similar image on the right, um, advertising a fashion of fashions of the pines on Fire Island uh, program. Uh, so, uh, so he was really um, very active in these kind of subcultural venues of fashion, fashion imagery, gay, um, sites uh, in and around New York, um, as well as the burgeoning field of gay publishing. He did a lot of illustrations for the covers of books that um, will seem uh, familiar to people of my generation. Um, uh, there was a feature on him, as you see, in uh, Christopher Street Magazine, and he did um, portrait um, posters for uh, uh, Lambda Legal, um, as you see here on the right. And there were a few art galleries in New York in the late 70s and 1980s that specialized in this kind of idea of gay art, uh, quote unquote. The Robert Samuel ga Gallery was one of them, but the most conspicuous was the Leslie Lohman Gallery, which was uh, subsequently institutionalized as the Leslie Lohman Museum of Gay and Lesbian Art, and now is simply the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art. And probably exemplifying the kind of artists that were um, uh, managed and promoted by those galleries. Um, somebody like Delmas Howe um, is uh, probably exemplary among that, uh, that group in that tradition. Um, and you, know, you can see here in this magazine cover from 1979 that you know, this, this worked, they got publicity. Interesting that in recent years, Delmas has evolved into a project um, a rather Gilbert Lewis project to document the people who settle in um, or pass through the little New Mexico town uh, where he lives now. Um, as I said, it's rather like Gilbert Lewis's interest in documenting the people of his community, whether they're kind of extravagantly clothed or altogether unclothed, um, and fits very much um, with, the, with the kind of works that um, we see coming from earlier decades. Um, in uh, Gilbert, uh, Gilbert Lewis's uh, paintings, because he really wasn't part of that 1970s um, New York art scene. He went to New York briefly, but um, didn't, didn't stay that long um, and returned back to Philadelphia. Um, some of his works have um, over the years been acquired by the Leslie Lohman Art Museum. I'm showing you a couple of them here. And in 2004, they mounted um, an exhibition of Lewis's um, art um, under the title Becoming Men. Um, about that exhibition, Gilbert Lewis said, and I think this is such an interesting quotation, I wish that the exhibition could have colored strings connecting the young men who modeled for me with the models who recommended them and the friends they recommended in turn. That would make a very interesting story, end quote. And so that comment really returns us to the theme of community. When he looks at these works, what he sees is the connections among these men. 
Um, and I want to use that um, idea of community uh, to segue to a kind of final um, part of, the, um, of this talk and really a connection of context that I find extremely interesting. And that is his close art school friendship with the artist Jody Pinto. Because when people today chart the history of gay art, in quotes, or lesbian art, in quotes, in the second half of the 20th century, they usually describe it as two very distinct movements. Um, the history of gay American art that I've traced in this talk, although it um, has clearly has roots in the um, queer expatriate community of Americans in Paris around uh, Gertrude Stein, so it has a kind of honorary lesbian origin, um, but it's really extremely different from the idea of lesbian art that grew up in the 90s, often really on the margins of the art world, um, in publications and venues like the Women's Building in Los Angeles, and I'm showing you here a little dough sculpture of the Women's Building by an artist named Nancy Fried, to make the point that along with the um, challenging the kind of imagery of um, patriarchal art, um, there was a really concerted uh, attempt to think through media and to use me, uh, you know, to kind of get away from traditional media that were associated with traditional conventional art um, and think about uh, media that, um, in this case, doe sculptures, um, you know, has a kind of connection to women's work, um, uh, what is trad traditionally considered women's work. And of course, one of the huge things that was challenged by artists in these circles was the depiction of the female nude because that that genre had been so kind of overdetermined by men's expectations, um, particularly ideas about what was era male gaze, which you know seemed to um, desire what it saw, possess through seeing, dominate, take um, uh, what it sees depicted, and so ways of thinking about the body um, among lesbian artists at this period were really um, extremely different uh, from the kind of gay art uh, that I've just been showing you. Um, as I say, these were very different cultures, the gay and lesbian uh, culture, and so it's um, in light of this kind of separatism in the art world, particularly probably the art world uh, in New York, it's so interesting to learn from Jody Pinto um, that, you know, she and um, Gilbert Lewis were really, really close friends at PAFA um, in the mid-60s when they were both art students together. And this book, um, uh, this, uh, the, uh, uh, a, a, a book of photographs just of sort of ex interesting sites and photographs uh, in, done in 1968, they just happened to be the two students who are depicted drawing in the cast room uh, at, at PAFA. Um, but it, you know, just, just gives you a sense of the two of them uh, together. Um, but here's what um, Jody says about that period. Quote, there was a group of us, gay men and women, she says, and, uh, you know, among the students at the time. And she says that they really connected in a class that was taught by Hobson Pittman, who was himself a gay artist, and by all accounts, a really gifted teacher at PAFA, and incidentally, also at Penn State, where he taught uh, during the summers, and so this is my little plug for the show that Bill also plugged, the next show coming up at Woodmere in uh, January um, about uh, the painting of Warren Rohr and the poetry of his wife, Jane Rohr. Warren Rohr studied with Hobson Pittman at the summer schools in, up here um, at Penn State in the 1950s. He's a really, really different painter than Gilbert Lewis, but what's so interesting is that their accounts of Hobson Pittman are so similar. Um, he really seems to have been a life-changing painter for any number of different kinds of artists. And the way that he did that was how he offered students to think of a context for their work, even a kind of art historical community, by connecting them with other artists, dead or living, um, who, whose work he saw as having something in common with theirs, and he encouraged them uh, to think of um, working in kind of... Um, conversation with, uh, with uh, those artists. So in the case of Gilbert Lewis's work, as Jody Pinto has described the crits that would go on, you know, for, you know, in, in the big auditorium at PAFA with a big audience of people, people could sign up and, you know, you were lucky to get a crit and 
the people, the teachers would come in and talk about the work as a kind of big public um, performance. Um, but she said one of the remarkable things about Pittman is that he would get very, very close to the work. And I'm showing you here one of Pittman's paintings, obviously, um, just to give you a sense of the kind of connection that there might have been between his work um, and Gilbert Lewis's uh, work at that period. So um, Jody described to me how he would draw close to the work, um, to what she describes as, as Gil's small and quiet paintings. And then she said he would turn and look at Gil and speak about music and pattern and early Italian paintings. He made it in a sense all right without saying anything. Have serious critiques of our work, quote unquote, she says, at a time when there was not a lot of encouragement, the work wasn't taken very seriously if it digressed from what was seen as the sort of path and norm at the time. So Pittman really seems to have been somebody who could appreciate and draw out individuality, diversity, difference, and kind of celebrate, um, celebrate those, those qualities. In his classroom critiques of Gilbert Lewis's art, Pittman, again, I'm quoting here um, from Jody, she said she, he quote unquote, talked about a gentleness, a softness, a regard. He also, and I think this is important, he noticed the bond between um, Gilbert Lewis and Jody Pinto and referred to them as Gertrude Stein and Alice P. Toklas in a joking kind of way, which is a subtle but very powerful kind of way of binding them into a legacy of modern art that brought gay men and lesbians together. It's a kind of signaling without saying um, that, that speaks to some of the kinds of values that I was talking about in the early 20th century art. And I'd like to think that Pittman, who had himself been awarded one of Paffo's Crescent Fellowships for his travel in Europe uh, when he was a student, might have had a hand in awarding his own Gertrude and Alice. You can see them here uh, in this picture of the people who got Crescent Scholarships in 1967 so that they could travel together to Europe, which they did. Um, and then they lived together for two years uh, in uh, Philadelphia after uh, they got back. And much of this is discussed in that um, catalog uh, that's available um, on the Woodmere site for this exhibition. Um, in some ways, the careers of Jody Pinto and Gilbert Lewis exemplify the differences between quote unquote lesbian and quote unquote gay art. Pinto's installations from the 1970s drew attention for the way that in keeping with other important lesbian artists like Harmony Hammond, for instance, they invoke the body without making a picture of it. And I, um, I'm putting up this slide, which comes from her website, so that you can write down the URL, which you can see at the top there, um, and uh, look at more of her work and really um, uh, uh, you know, her statements about her work. And uh, it, it would be a whole different talk, but it's, it's well worth spending time um, with uh, Jody Pinto's work which has been you know, known as extremely important in the kind of uh, idea of gay and lesbian art um, since, uh, since at least the 1980s. Um, and as I said, so the, you know, the idea of kind of, here's a sculpture that is exuding a kind of red liquid uh, when, it, when it rains. So it has a kind of allusion to the body that uh, liquids that ooze or move. Here's another um, example with the, Again, something that um, the one on the left where uh, when, when rain hits it, um, the red dyed liquid comes out of these sort of body-like packets or in the tart and feather structure that you see on the right, something happens to the sculpture that is um, a reference to what can happen to bodies, um, particularly you know, bodies that are attacked. Um, probably her best known work uh, in the Philadelphia area uh, a structure uh, in nature, as you can see here, that proposes itself, and this is her um, you know, drawing, a kind of proposal drawing for it, as part of a giant body. You can walk through it in the park um, and, and sort of imagine a, a body on a kind of uh, enormous scale. Um, about this, Jody Pinto said, quote, when I think of a bridge, I think of reaching, of touching, of connection, so I decided to use the shape of a finger for the bridge. Gilbert Lewis, as we've seen uh, in the exhibition at Woodmere, did something different with the conventions of the nude um, that have so often been applied by men to women 
um, and he put them to a different purpose. Affirming forms of desire outside of heteronormativity, certainly, but also creating, documenting, celebrating an idea of community rather than a kind of fantasy of coupledom. He stressed the connections among models who came to him, the social connections that he created in talking with those models in the situation of creating the portrait. Uh, in the catalog uh, to this exhibition, Tony Rollo, who's once one of his frequent models and now the PAFA show will, um, will be about those paintings. So I think I, um, there's uh, Tony and I think there's a, there's a image from the website of PAFA to um, promote that show a little bit. Um, uh, Tony said, quote, I loved modeling for him because he was so interesting. I'd walk in and we'd have these two hour conversations about things that I wouldn't otherwise be talking about. He could look at the most ordinary thing and tell me how beautiful it was. I'd never looked at things like that before. So this is a, a, you know, a different kind of connection of which you know, the erotic can be part, but it's also aesthetic, it's also social, it's also political. Um, and his, uh, his depictions of the nude um, you know, really deviate from this kind of conventional idea of the male gaze as kind of desiring, dominating, having by seeing, and open up, therefore, into, um, into that, that kind of broader idea of an actual sexual community. So what I want to suggest is that both Jody Pinto and Gilbert Lewis were, like a lot of other gay and lesbian artists, disrupting conventions of the nude, not in a kind of nattery, conservative, negative kind of way, but by reimagining how essential engagement with the body could be to transformed into art. And I want to end by proposing one more connection in this, my sort of final context for the appreciation of Gilbert Lewis's work. Um, so I want to look at a different work by Jody Pinto, the redesign of the beachfront uh, in Santa Monica, which was done in 2002. In her artist statement, which I put at the top of the screen here, um, Pinto talks of quote unquote, peeling back a film, revealing what was already there, exposing the possibilities, the human theater of the beach, the people, their activities become the central focus of the design. And that phrase human theater jumped out at me. And indeed, um, when I asked Jody Pinto about it, she told me that this, she said, the idea of human theater informs all of my projects. And maybe that was one of the reasons that early on I responded to Gill's work. There was a theater in it, a quiet theater that was very touching and at the same time confident. So that's the idea that I'm going to end with, an idea of celebration, something that we can think of as the human theater. The phrase connotes, I think, a fundamentally aesthetic response uh, to life, a response to the variety and diversity of the world around us, a celebration of people's stories, especially when those stories fall outside convention. I mean, I love that thing he says about talking to the elderly and they would tell him things their children, their children didn't know. A delight in the little acts of self-presentation that hint at those stories when people put on a particular kind of an outfit or a kind of an earring. Um, the kind of intimacy, the sexual intimacy in which some of those stories might be told. A desire to imagine something like a community of outsiders. So even though their work looks so different, I think that context of kind of gay and lesbian art trying to reimagine bodies, people, societies um, in a new way at this period um, comes together in this idea of human theater um, that, that, unites, uh, that unites these two very, very different bodies of work. Thanks. That's the end of the talk. And so I'm gonna stop screen sharing and I think that means we can have a conversation. Okay, you there, Bill? <laughs> I see you. I'm here, and and Chris, that was so much to take in, and uh oh, well, I mean, and and so beautiful to you know at the beginning of your talk to connect. Gilbert Lewis and a history of gay artists, including, you know, Charles Demuth. And I would confirm that, nice cat. Um, yeah, she's, she's a detention hog. Um, 
I've had the experience in Woodmere's galleries of people saying, wow, you know, these still lives remind me of Demuth. And then, you know, they turn to the figurative work and I don't think there's the same connection, you know, between the figurative work of Gilbert Lewis and the still life work of Gilbert Lewis. And I think that has to do with the, something that you did so beautifully, which is place the still lives in this history and place the figurative work in a history that comes later. I mean, maybe starting with Maplethorpe and others. And then what I think was so beautiful about what you just did was also really place Gilbert Lewis in Philadelphia. I mean, again, with the concept of gay community news, but also at PAFA and his relationship with Jody, but also with Hobson Pittman, who I've never, to be honest, I mean, never really thought about seriously in terms of a gay history of art. But now that you brought that out, it makes so much meaning for me and makes me curious about more things that I want to know. So I feel like what you did was really beautiful in terms of placing Gilbert in this very broad history that has to do with Philadelphia, but also has to do with the broad stream of American art. And it was very exciting to hear. Um, thank you, Chris. That was totally fantastic. Um, I don't know if I, I, I um, I'm gonna ask Hildy, I don't know if you can hear me, and I don't know if I have access to the question stream, but I'd love to take questions from people. Um, Bill, I do hear you, and there actually aren't any questions, but I think it's partially because this was, I think we're all thinking about, <laughs> you know, no, really, I mean, just kind of all the connections that you made along the way within art history, but I mean, just this thought of human theater and celebrate and, and Gilbert Gilbert's, you know, um, you know, amazingly compassionate portrayal of the human spirit and capturing that. And I mean, we've done programs with people with um, Alzheimer's and their caregivers, and that's that is immediately what they respond to. I mean, they're 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 looking and they're saying. I, you know, I, I see, I feel the pathos in this person. I see the, you know, this isn't just, this man's shirt is too big for him. This, you know, his collar's too big. That, you know, what was, you know, um, I'm talking about the portrait of the older man holding up the bird, mm -hmm. you know, and just, just being able to, con that they feel this connection with these human beings in mm -hmm. ways that, don't always, you know, don't always, don't always have, it, portraits don't always have that kind of an impact. So when you talk about community, it's, not, it's almost as if the portraits are creating a community with the viewer. Mm -hmm. It's pretty powerful, so. Yeah, I hope so. And I mean, I, you know, I'm happy to talk, although I certainly encourage people to put something on the Q&A. It doesn't have to be a Q. I don't have all the answers. You can uh, put, put, put your own uh, statements on. But, um, but I was really interested in putting together the talk by the accounts of Hobson Pittman to go back to um, what Bill was saying and um, and the way that Jody described these giant crits on Fridays of Pafa and people turning up to sort of see what would be said. And she said, and you know, he would look at painting and then turn around and talk to the assembled students about opera. And that idea of kind of inducting people, you know, no matter where they came from or what kind of family backgrounds they came from, but into some sort of world of culture that is um, almost synesthetic. It like involves all of your senses. Um, so it, you know, it would pay attention to the way fabrics feel. It would pay attention to, you know, uh, the, the, the way a body feels as it, as it moves wearing fabrics as well as kind of what things look like, an idea of costume, an idea of theatricality. Um, and that that could be so meaningful to him 
And meanwhile, what I'm finding out about Hobson Pittman by researching Warren Rohr for the next show is, you know, this Mennonite high school teacher who'd grown up on a farm in Lancaster County and gone to a Mennonite college to learn preaching. And he, he comes up here in the summer because the gym teacher at the high school that he was at um, told him that he would earn more money if he got a master's degree in education during the summer. And Hobson Pittman basically encourages him to think of himself as a romantic landscape painter and then also as an abstract modernist and introduces him to this entirely other kind of canon of art. Um, and that idea of inducting people into an aesthetic that's enabling for them, I do think, I mean, it's an amazingly generous way to teach, but it, it's also, in, I mean, there's something kind of queer about it, right? That, that people can remake themselves aesthetically in a kind of global tradition you know, doesn't come from their immediate families. Um, uh, and, and, and that that will somehow, you know, it will express who they already were, but it will also allow them to become, uh, to become somebody else in connection with other artistic people. Chris, I have a question. And again, I, if there are other people who have questions, I don't want to dominate the questions, but there are artists out side of the gay history of art that seem relevant here um, to Gilbert. You know, there's a wonderful description in the catalog by Jody of the experience of seeing Goya together, you know, with Gilbert and how impactful that was emotionally. Um, but then, you know, a number of people have mentioned Alice Neal in terms of 20th century portraiture, a kind of, you know, a kind of use of color and, um, you know, um, a certain kind of sitter. I, I wonder, um, and again, I, I don't mean to sort of throw artists at you that, you know, maybe, you know, um, but, but, but your thoughts about, you know, Gilbert Lewis and a tradition of art history that is not the gay history of art. Yeah, but it is the outsider's history of art, right? Yeah, I guess that's true. Alice Neal. Yeah, and Goya, you know, yeah. I mean, the kinds of Goya that they were looking at. Um, yeah. uh, uh, the, the horrors of war things. Um, that's, um, I mean, it is, it is a kind of idea of being an, being an artist as being an outsider and, and making something effective out of that. Mm -hmm. I, I actually can see the question. Yeah, I did. There's a chat. The chat room is actually where people are putting some comments and questions. So do you see them, Chris, or do you want yeah. me to read it? Um, I can. Um, do we want to take the last one here? If you sure. Want, yeah. You that's what I don't know that I really have an answer, but somebody else can possibly provide an answer. Yeah, so there's a question. No doubt Lewis male homoerotic homo portraits were avant-garde. What do we know of Lewis, Lewis's political activism, his views? After all, he studied, worked, and worked in Philadelphia during the Nashian Gay um, Liberation Movement. So would anybody care to comment? Or well, the I, I'll just jump in and say, and Jody Pinto was really front and center in feminist, um, lesbian feminist politics. Um, she founded an anti-rape coalition um, she debated Mayor Rizzo. She, you know, she was absolutely out there in that very political kind of way. Um, and, you know, to be honest, I don't think um, Gilbert Lewis was. It was much more of a kind of cultivation of, of a kind of enabling subculture. Other people may know him better, and if people want to kind of weigh in on this, um, uh, I'd be happy to defer to somebody else's, to somebody else's knowledge. Um, but it, but it's true. I mean, it's not always true that the, you know, kind of subcultural art movement and the explicitly political go together, although they really did in Jody Pinto's career. Um, there is a question. Oh, Bill, did you want to say, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, I, I just wanted to add to what you just said, Chris, is that I, I also recall a conversation with 
Jody about Gilbert and specifically Philadelphia during the years of Rizzo being mayor. And I think, and, and I don't know if Jody is on this call, I hope you are, but um, what I recall from Jody's um, comment was that, you know, the life in Philadelphia under Rizzo for a gay person, and, you know, Rizzo was openly homophobic and anti-gay and, and um, you know, had the worst possible kind of um, cultural position <laughs> as, you know, a, a macho guy. And um, what, what Jody said to the effect was that, yeah, you know, Rizzo's Philadelphia is the backdrop of Gilbert's work. It wasn't a direct confrontation. And I think, you know, that's what you just said. You know, Jody's work is a direct confrontation. For Gilbert, it's the backdrop and it's something of a, you know, a visceral reaction to it that channels in a different way, but that it's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really well put. Mm -hmm. That might connect to the question that's come in on the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you, do you that yeah, you sure. How do you feel Gilbert Lewis's work has influenced today's method of queer portraiture and sculpture, photography, and painting? Again, I mean, maybe my answer is disappointing because I don't know that it has itself been a big in influence, quote unquote. Um, he's somebody who worked very much kind of within his community and sort of for his community, um, but there wasn't a kind of big breakout moment that would have, you know, propelled this work into enough uh, of a kind of, you know, sort of visibility for it to really become influential. I mean, so that's partly why I think these uh, three exhibitions are really exciting now. I mean, it's really a project to look at somebody whose work took place in a subcultural context and kind of bring it out uh -huh. and to people's attention and appreciation at a moment when maybe, you know, it can be more, um, more appreciated. Um, you know, there's something to be said for, there's something to be said for the idea of subculture, which is not the same idea as, you know, changing the whole rest of the culture. It's really about creating a kind of livable, beautiful um, world around one. And I think uh, Gilbert, Gilbert Lewis was kind of more in that uh, vein than in the kind of, uh, you know, sort of big art historical story of influence. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would like to add that it is so sad to me that we are in this strange moment of a pandemic. Um, you know, museum exhibitions get planned years and years and years in advance. And it has been absolutely wonderful to work with BAFA, with um, the William Way LGBT Community Center, but also with two commercial galleries, um, you know, with Cap Cap, a relatively new um, and exciting gallery in Philadelphia, a commercial art gallery that's really tearing it up, and with um, Torrention Gallery, a sort of New York based gallery, but that has a big presence online and is tearing up the internet. And, um, you know, there, there's something a little bit sad to me that, that now, you know, all of our schedules has, have been disrupted by COVID. We were going to coordinate everything and all that coordination, you know, got blown to smithereens. But it was very moving to hear what you just, just, just said, Chris, about, you know, sort of, you know, an artist having a breakout moment. And you know, we really were working to make this the breakout moment because I feel that collectively we all so much believe in the work. And, um, you know, perhaps despite the times, our efforts, and I, I believe that our efforts, you know, will bring Gilbert's work into the conversation with the work of younger artists. And 
Um, I, I do want to give a shout out to Aaron Feltman, who is a young artist, who's a wonderful artist, an artist um, who's been part of this whole conversation that we've done a Zoom dialogue with as well, and has given a presentation from the point of view of an artist. And, you know, I, I do think that what's so interesting in today's times is how realism in the arts does seem to have a new place in the universe of contemporary art that is, is um, you know, whether you're talking about African-American subject matter, gay subject matter, that I, I, I wonder, and, and Chris, I would, I would ask you to, to, to comment um, if, if you'd like, but there is something interesting going on in contemporary art in terms of realism and the arts and the way that realism can be subversive. And I would like to think that Gilbert's, Lew Gilbert's work, Gilbert Lewis's work, can play an important, can, can be a part of that conversation or part of that symphony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I also think the, I mean, you know, clearly a lot of our lives have moved online in a way that's not going to come back. So, I mean, one of the things is I very much admire the way that you've moved this exhibition online and um, the kind of programming in general and that there will be a record of this. And so, you know, it is something that it will spread in a different kind of way than the way that we're used to, even though you and I really miss the idea of a kind of, you know, gallery full of people looking yeah. at art. Together. Um, together, exactly. But I, and, but I also feel like this situation has made me, at least, much more aware of my own communities, of the people who are, you know, who do write or, you know, come by and have socially distanced <laughs> gatherings in the yard, um, uh, you know, uh, and, and, you know, that's important work, too, to figure out how to make a sustainable community and to encourage people to sort of be in it and drop through and use it as an opportunity to find themselves, express themselves. Um, there's, there's something about that in his work that models something different than kind of, you know, politics with a capital P or influence with a capital I. Um, and I think we're all trying to try to figure out how to move forward and maybe it can help with that in little atomized individualistic through the screen ways that, you know, then help people feel more at home in the world uh, that, that we're in. That sounded worris worrisomely grand. <laughs> no, but very beautiful. Um, there is a comment by Patrick Terentian, who is saying, don't worry, the November exhibition will not be overlooked by the young talent at PAFA. It will be a revelation for them. So I just wanted to share that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Patrick. Well, with that, I would love to say thank you, Chris. Thank you, Hildy. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everyone. That was truly fantastic. The kind of thing, you know, I feel like we have to do more of at Woodmere, which is to, to present the work of Philadelphia's artists in terms of the broader context of American art, but also the cultural ideas that shape life, you know, not only, not only in America, but worldwide. And I think this was an example of that in a very powerful way. So Chris, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much. Um, I am so happy that um, we were able to be together on Zoom That's tonight, um, but that also that we've recorded this because I feel that there is so much from this that will grow. There were a lot of images by Gilbert that I hadn't seen before that I was thrilled to see. And, um, you know, you know, want to know more about, you know, that guy in the leather pants and all of that. But um, 
totally fantastic. And um, well, thank, thank you, Chris. You. Thank, thank you, you. Hildy. Thank you, everyone. And now there's a reception, right? But we all have to provide our own <laughs> food and drink. I know. <laughs> well, <laughs> I drank my glass of wine. It's empty. I've been to the reception. Thank you so well, much for including me in. Felt like community here for an hour. Thank you. We will see you soon. Thank you, Chris. It was and wonderful, Chris. Thank you. Okay. And I'm seeing a lot of thank yous coming in, which is so wonderful. I see one from Aaron. So nice from Julia, Julia Kasdorp. So cheers. Thank you. Yeah. That was fantastic. Totally fantastic. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Have a good night.